Hey, what's up? This is Dr. Corey Glenn, and I'm going to be sharing a case today that is a full arch guided surgery on a maxilla where we did an immediate load prosthesis. Uh, so this past weekend, I had the opportunity to go to Charleston, South Carolina and work with Dr. Ryan Gilreath at his practice. Uh, myself and Danny Doming also uh, went up there and we did a couple of full arch cases with him. This was actually the case that we did on our second day. Um, and it went really good, so I just thought I'd share it because uh, there's a lot of useful tips in it. Real quick before you jump into it, uh, if you're interested in taking any courses, these are the ones I've got coming up. Uh, if you've not ever done guided surgery, maybe you're placing implants but you've never done guided, or if you're just getting into implants, the comprehensive guided surgery course is usually the, uh, the baseline uh, course that I teach. So that's going to be at my farm in Suwannee, Tennessee on May 5th and 6th. And then there's going to be two opportunities for the advanced full arch course that goes over uh, just purely full arch, smile design, um, immediate load, prosthetics, uh, stackable guides, all of that. I'm doing that in Manly, Australia on April 21st and 2nd, and then also Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, July 7th and 8th. So if you need a, a good excuse to write off some fun vacations, that would be some good opportunities. And then I'll be just doing, uh, you know, guest speaking spots at the AAID district meeting in Chicago on June 9th through 11th, and then also at the AGD national meeting in Vegas on July 19th of 20th. All right, so let's jump into this case. This is the patient that we worked on, and, you know, her main complaint was she's uh, really unable to wear her upper denture. And if you look at that ridge on the patient's right, or on the picture on the right, you can tell why. She's just got a really atrophic ridge. Um, Dr. Gilreath had made her this denture, and it's really a nice denture. Aesthetically, it looks great. She just can't keep it in because she has no bone to retain it. And so you can see the facial uh, analysis that I've done. We've got the facial midline, her interpupillary line, and then I've pulled that same line down uh, to evaluate her incisal edges and the cants. And so I always try before I start these cases to really evaluate the smile critically because you know anything that we place as far as implants we actually have to restore so i want to make sure we have the ideal teeth before we start planting implants and so again he made my job easy here because we uh we had such a good denture to start with um if you notice here the the canine to canine width is perfect we don't need to change anything on that um, however there's about a one degree cant you can see it heading uphill to her left uh, when compared to that interpupillary line. So we're going to fix that. And then she also wanted just a little bit more length on her teeth. Okay. And here you can see that yellow line is the interpupillary line translated down. The red line is the, uh, the current cant to the denture. So it's literally one degree off. So that's going to be easy changes to make. And I always like to do this little transparent overlay uh, with my data from Blue Sky Plan just so that I can really get myself oriented makes it a lot easier when I'm doing the setup for the new teeth. All right, so we're going to start this case by going into Blue Sky Plan. Uh, this is going to be a bone supported case for reasons I'll say in a minute, but whenever that's the case, we need to start by doing bone segmentation. And so here we have the uh, segmentation done in Blue Sky Plan, and now we can bring in all of our models and then start designing the wax up. So this is the wax up made in the Blue Sky Denture uh, module. And you can see the top, the purple, is her existing denture. And then the white on the bottom is my, my new wax up. And then you can see it transparent on that top image. Very, very minor differences. Uh, you can see, particularly on the patient's left side, how I've brought the length of those teeth down to correct that cant. But aside from that, not a whole lot of changes were made. So now that we have tooth positions, we can actually begin planting implants, right? So I always want the tooth positions first because I really have to position these implants appropriately to support those particular teeth. And so on the anteriors, we're trying to emerge lingual to incisal edges. Um, in the posterior, we're trying to make sure we come through the occlusal table or maybe just lingual to it. But we really want to avoid, if at all possible, using angled multis if we can avoid them. And then secondarily, we don't want to have facial screw access holes. And so you can see the implant positions we came up with here. Just due to the anatomy and how atrophic she was, where her sinuses were, we were able to get five implants in there well spaced. And uh, they're all coming out in nice positions. She's got molar support on both sides. So I think this should be a great case to do immediate load. Um, here you see the implants without the teeth turned on. Uh, and this is on the jaw after it's had reduction done, which we'll see another image of that. 
So these are our implant sizes, three and a half by 11 on the number three, three and a half by 10 on number six, three and a half by 11 and a half on number eight, three and a half by 10 on number 10, and a four three by 13 on number 14. Um, so I would have loved to have gone with uh, some larger diameter implants, but that's literally all she had room for uh, without you know doing some grafting. And then furthermore, the, the length, we just couldn't get much more length except for on that disto angled one because we're literally at the floor of her nose. And you can see that here, we've got on the top a facial view uh, slice through each implant site. And then on the bottom set of images, that's the cross-sectional image. So you can see we're right at the base of the uh, nose or of the sinus, you know, depending on the site. All right, so we went into Blue Sky Plan and we generated the guides. Now this was going uh, more of my old school method, which there's there's a time and a place for that, uh, where I do swappable guides. Okay, so I've shown many cases where we use the stackable system and those are great, but they're a lot more effort. These cases are really straightforward and easy to plan because all you do is once you've got your tubes and your implants and everything positioned, you just simply make a guide and then you're going to make bone reduction cuts, you know, a millimeter supra crestal to the implant uh, platform. And that's what generates your reduction windows. And so that's all this guide is. You could make this thing in five minutes. It's no problem. And then we will swap that out after bone reduction is done with a drilling guide. Okay, so, and actually, let me go back and mention one thing. You know, my typical rule is I don't need a bone reduction guide unless there's about four to five millimeters or more of bone reduction to do. Now, we don't have that here. However, I do think it's a good idea to do some bone reduction on this uh, jaw first because that ridge is so sharp. If you try to take your initial drills and penetrate into that sharp ridge, it's going to want to slide down. And so just by doing the reduction guide, we get a flat surface and we can get a good straight on penetration into that bone. Okay, so again, this is our drill guide. Now I want to point out that this guide looks very, very similar to the previous guide. Okay, and that's because it's literally the same guide. Um, you can see in this video here, this is the bone reduction guide. And what I'm going to do here is turn on the drilling guide. And as you can see, it's the exact same guide, only with the addition of the guide tubes. So that really uh, makes your, your guide design process much easier. You can also see there where I turned on the prosthesis. The immediate load prosthesis is also going to be uh, based on that exact same guide. And so we can use a single guide to, to serve as our guide for all three processes. Uh, we use the reduction guide for the bone reduction. We add the guide tubes for the drilling guide to the reduction guide. And then we add the uh, prosthesis to the reduction guide. And that's all three guides. It's a really easy workflow. So uh, even though it might be a little bit more trouble in the surgery because you do have to swap them out, you're making that back by saving a lot of time in your planning uh, stages. So you know, there's a time and a place for it. So we printed all these models. I always like to have printed models so that we can kind of do a dry run on the surgery and, uh, you know, go through the drill protocols and everything and then test fit all of our guides as well. So these are the printed models. You can see the bone reduction guide printed here and it's uh, fitting well. And with this particular design, you can see that I left this little strut in the middle because if you don't have that, there can be a tendency to overseat this on the, uh, the facial aspect because you don't have a positive stop. So what I'll often do is instead of cutting this all away, I'll actually leave a little strut there that's going to rest on bone and I won't reduce that bone because that will give all your subsequent guides something to positively seat on. Uh, same here in the posterior. I would rather have this buckle only, but by having these back here, it's going to make it stronger for a resin guide, since this is not a metal one. And then secondarily, it's going to give a positive stop in the posterior. So you get a really accurate fit with these. And here you see the drilling guide. Again, it's just the reduction guide with the guide tubes added. Um, you don't have to have this cross arch strut. I just added that for some stability and stiffness. Uh, you know, that can also be useful if you want to tie off your, your palatal flaps to it. You can do that or you can remove it. It doesn't really matter. 
but since this is the same guide as the previous one, that's going to be a check on your fit because if you can't line up the pinholes, you know you're not fully seating. It should seat the exact same way as the reduction guide did. And then finally, here is the immediate load prosthesis. This is all printed in one piece out of a permanent crown and bridge resin. And once again, it's just the reduction guide. Now on this one, I did remove the lingual because I figured it's going to be difficult to get this to seat over the cylinders with that in place. But I did leave a little hook here as a positive stop for the uh, posterior. And, you know, once you line this up and you push your pins in, that's going to hold this in the vertical dimension uh, with all the anatomy correct for you to put in your cylinders and pick them up in the right position. And then once that's done, you can just come back and cut this little bone end index off. Here's the pictures of the prosthesis. Again, everything lined up on the models. She had great occlusion on here. And so as long as we do the surgery in the same way that it's planned for these, uh, these guides and these models, then everything should come out perfectly. So now we're gonna jump to the surgery. So I've got this sped up two and a half X. Um, I'll, I, when I cut out all of the non-essential parts, you know, where we're grabbing a part or whatever, the entire surgery was 18 minutes. So that really tells you how efficient you can be with these. So here you see Ryan, he is, you, he seated the pin guide after making his flap. Uh, um, the pin guide is also the reduction guide, right? So he's drilling the pin holes with that 2.2 uh, millimeter drill. And after each one of them, he puts his pin in and now that's locked in place. And now he's beginning to do the bone reduction. And so there's different ways of doing this. Uh, Ryan here is using a uh, electric straight hand piece with a big E cutter burr. Uh, I think we did end up swapping that burr out uh, midstream just because it wasn't cutting real efficiently. But I would suggest try to use a pretty aggressive burr on this. Uh, we've also used Lindemann burrs in a high speed hand piece. Um, there's also the nail head burrs that uh, you know, you can spin in a high speed. Those do a really nice job and they make a really flat surface. Um, there's lots of tools that will work for this. You could even use piezo, it's just as slow, uh, but all of them work. All right, so Ryan's finished the bone reduction. That went pretty quick because there's not a whole lot to do, but now he's got this nice flattened off ridge surface. And so he's just taken that guide off, thrown it away, and now he's placed in the drilling guide. And once again, it should fit the exact same way. So you can see he had no trouble putting those pins in. And now he's going to start using the Blue Sky uh, Bio fully guided kit for the Biomax system. So this first drill, that's the profile drill. And you always should use that uh, because that's going to profile out the space for all of your subsequent drills to seat. Then you'll begin working through your drill sequence. So you'll start narrow and short. This is the two millimeter by six millimeter drill. So it's six millimeters long, two millimeters in diameter. And this will penetrate really easily. It keeps you on track and it's going to give somewhere for the subsequent drills to feed into. So now that he's finished that, we've gone to the two and a half by eight. So technically you're supposed to go uh, in the the small diameter up to length and then over to diameter. Honestly, I typically work diagonally across. Um, so here he's going up in length. Remember, these are three five implants. So this two and a half is going to be the final drill uh, that we'll use on every site except for that disto angled four three implant. So all the osteotomies are done. They're at full depth now. And now he's removing the guide. Now the reason he's doing this, uh, because we still haven't placed implants, is because we're going to immediate load this. And for immediate loading, it's always a bit of a question mark whether you'll get good primary stability. So I really like to use these rotary bone expanders. Okay, so Blue Sky sells a kit of these. There's numerous companies that have these, but they work really well. I used them almost every maxillary case when I was still practicing. Uh, same technique as osteotomes, it's just that you can drive them in with a ratchet or a handpiece and they come in progressively bigger sizes. So here, for example, those 3.5 implants, we stopped at a 2.5 drill. We're going to use a 3.0 expander and then we'll place the 3.5 implants and those will do some expansion as well. But the result is you end up getting really, really high primary stability. And that's really an important factor when you're going to do immediate load like this. So now that he's done that, he's put the guide back in and we're ready to place implants. So 
This is actually the plasma lock from Blue Sky Bio. And what this does is it just treats the surface with a uh, plasma field and it gets rid of all the hydrocarbons on the surface, makes the implants a lot more hydrophilic. And there's numerous pieces of literature that suggest this really enhances integration, that you get faster integration because, you know, all the blood cells adhere to it better. Um, you know, it decontaminates all of that kind of stuff. So it's a nice little tool that can really up your chances, particularly in uh, medically compromised patients, you know, anything like that, immediate load where you really just need it to have the best shot it can. I really like to use that plasma lock. And so now Ron's placing the implants using the fully guided carrier. You can see he drove it in most of the way with the handpiece carrier, but now he's torquing it in uh, with the ratchet driver. And he'll go to depth on this until the guided carrier bottoms out, and then he knows he's at depth. And I don't know if I really show this, but you might notice on those two disto angled implants, there is a notch on the guide uh, that's kind of angled. That's a timing mark. And that tells Ryan that when he cranks these implants in and he's at depth, he just needs to line one of the flats of the implant hex up to that line. And if he does that, then it's going to be positioned in the same way in the mouth as it was in the software. So his multi-unit abutment will line up. All right, so he's almost got all his implants in. He's cranking these in. We got really great stability on all of them. And then this one was a little difficult to get in there with that long handpiece driver. Um, but, you know, he was able to get it in there and we'll drive that into place. And once that's in place, we'll crank it in the rest of the way with the ratchet driver, get it to full depth. And that essentially completes the surgery aspect of this. It went very, very fast. Uh, you know, we had done surgery the day before that was much slower. And my goodness, just the learning curve over that one day uh, was amazing how smooth this case went. All right, so with the surgery done, now we're ready to move forward with the prosthetics. And so he'll start by pulling out those pins and then he can take this uh, drill guide and the implant guide off and then we can begin placing the multi-units. You see that one's taking a lot of torque to get it in there. Oh, we got one more implant. So this is the other disto angled implant going in. And that's where he torqued out. So I didn't mention it, but the handpiece was set at 30 Newton centimeters, which is kind of your minimum for immediate load. And so when the handpiece torqued out at 30, he would just switch to the ratchet driver. And so now that implant is in and you can see he's uh, looking at that timing and there's actually dots. There's six dots on that carrier that tell you where the flats of the hex are. So just line one of those up with the timing mark and now your implant's exactly positioned. All right, so there's our implants. Um, now we're ready to put on the multi-unit abutments. Uh, looks like that one he may be torqued in a little bit more just to get it a tiny bit deeper. All right, so now multi-unit abutments are going on. Uh, so the four anteriors were straight and we will generally use the three millimeter collar height because that's typically about how much space off the bone you want to leave before your prosthesis starts. And so using that three millimeter, we're gonna have plenty of room for tissue. Now for these disto angled ones, they can be pretty tricky to get in. So you saw that Ron was profiling the distal aspect of the bone, because anytime you've got a disto angled one, that deeper aspect is gonna be on the distal. Now, even though we had timing built in, you're seeing here, there's multiple ways that that, that uh, angled multi can go in. It can go in one of six ways. And so initially it was placed a little too buckle. And so we kind of looked at it and then actually uh, took it out and rotated it uh, 60 degrees into this position, which matches what it was in the software. And so this is how we get everything lined up for the multis. And now we'll just have to place the other one. Uh, you'll notice that he's using this little delivery aid tool. Those can make a big difference in just helping you handle these because they're pretty difficult to get in. And now we're going to go to the uh, prosthesis. Uh, so you can see here, the, the prosthesis seated just like the previous guides did, only this time you can see that the temp cylinders are right in the middle of it. Now typically it's easier to go ahead and place this, seat your pins, and then to put your cylinders through the holes. And we actually did have to stretch a couple of holes, 
uh, which is not unusual. I've made those pretty small. Um, but you can see there's not a ton to patch up here. This is going to be pretty easy to do the conversion on. Once you've got your cylinders on, you can go ahead and do the pickup. Um, it's always wise to go ahead and plug the access holes um, unless you're using the long screws because you don't want to squirt that material in there and get yourself blocked out from your screw hole and then have to go digging for it. And so these are just the little tips of micro brush handles that are being used to uh, to plug those holes and then we're using a uh, dual cure acrylic resin called Stellar which is made by Taub. I really like it. It bonds well to composite or to acrylic. This being a composite printed uh, prosthetic it works well for both cases. Alright so this is going in place and we'll shoot all of that in. Um, you can either let it dual cure or you can let it uh, be light cured once you've got everything in place. So we actually let it dual cure for a little bit and then hit it with the light just to make really good and certain that these are all set up. The worst thing that can happen is you pull this too early while that material is soft and now you end up with your cylinder positions distorted and things don't seat back in the mouth properly. And so not a whole lot of cleanup to do on this. Uh, on the occlusal aspect, we'll just remove a little bit of that excess pink resin. You could have certainly used a, a white resin on this. We just had pink on hand. Now you typically will on the underside, you'll have more voids. And so that'll be the next step is that we'll uh, go ahead and fill those voids in. All right, once we've got the uh, temp out of the mouth, then you can simply cut this little bone index off. It's just connected by three little struts. It's like a three millimeter uh, tube extension. So when you section those little three tubes, the whole thing just falls away, leaving you access to your prosthetic. And we don't need this anymore to index the position because now we're indexed off of the implants. Okay, so you can see now where the voids are up here. And so now we'll have to go in with the flowable and fix that. Uh, we need to make this a nice ovate contour so that it's cleansable. And here you can see we've placed analogs onto the implant. Now anytime I do uh, full arch conversions, I always like to place an analog onto these temp cylinders because otherwise as you're trying to flow flowable right up to the neck of your, your temp cylinder, you can end up going internal into your, your uh, multi-unit fitting and then you end up having passivity issues and it's difficult to get out. So just by having the analog on there, it, it prevents you from running into that problem. So we'll patch up all of these holes and I'm just using a flowable composite here to do that. And then here you see the final trimmed uh, hybrid. Now I didn't have any red stain, otherwise I would have gone back and restained this, but this is from where I, I reduced some of that facial uh, ledge, you know, just to make it more cleansable. But the big thing I want to point out is that this is a smooth ovate contour everywhere. There's no negative emergence profile anywhere. There's no concavities because that can be the kiss of death on a case like this. You know, you do a beautiful surgery and then you put a ridge lap on there where you can't clean it. And now the patient ends up with periimplantitis because you didn't give them a cleansable restoration. So this is all trimmed, polished. It's ovate everywhere. And now we're ready to take it to the mouth. And here you can see right after we screwed this thing in, this was the initial bite following us uh, screwing that in. Um, this, the tissue is not, uh, we're not attempting to get primary closure on the tissue. In fact, the suturing was done after the fact. We're actually suturing the tissue to the temporary prosthesis. And that's what's going to give us a really nice bed of thick keratinized gingiva. Um, but this is the bite the first time she bit down. So that's really a great looking bite. It just had to have some minor adjustments. And we'll see the full smile shot here. This is our patient after she woke up from sedation. And as you would expect, she was extremely happy with the result. She loved the look of the new teeth and loved most of all that they're fixed in there and she doesn't have to have a denture coming out uh, all the time anymore. So, you know, I would speculate that the entire cost for this case as far as uh, exports from Blue Sky for, for uh, printing the guides, for printing the prosthesis, for sure it was all under $40. Of course, you got your implant cost and all of that, but from a perspective of making a case go this smoothly, doing it freehand to save 40 bucks, I, I just don't see it. This is a very quick way to plan cases. It'll work for the vast majority of full arch cases if you want to go this route. And it just made it so much more streamlined and predictable, too, because we know where the implants are going to end up. 
So patient was really happy. Dr. Gilreath did an awesome surgery on this. And uh, so we were off for a celebration after this one. So that's, that's the team there. This is Dr. Doming down in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, myself, and then Dr. Gilreath. We uh, actually headed out on the bay in Charleston uh, following that surgery and just kind of saw the sights, had a good time. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the case. Um, you know, it's hard to, hard to argue with it. It just went very smoothly and it's an efficient way to get these cases done predictably. And so again, if you're interested in learning any of this, we've got some courses coming up, we'd love to have you and I uh, hope that was helpful.